Uh, I'm Holger Blijf, I work for ING Bank that you might know as ING Bank Slansky, as far as I know, here. And I had the department of data scientists and data engineers within ING in the Netherlands. Um, I've been doing that for about three years now. Um, and from there on, uh, we got involved with uh, a couple of projects, and mainly that was actually scratching some itches uh, in the Hadoop domain that we really didn't fit as what we needed. Um, we consider a bank a bit of an enterprise, and sometimes the enterprise does not adjust to the, to the surroundings. We'd like to adjust the surroundings to us, and that's kind of what we did in certain circumstances. Hopefully we did it in a nice way that, uh, that we actually contributed back to the community and I'm here today to talk about Airflow um, and what Airflow, um, what the best practices are a little bit and an introduction to that. And uh, I can actually talk about that because I coincidentally became a committer because of this on uh, nowadays Apache incubating Airflow. Um, uh, and we'll share a little bit of that story with you guys. It's okay. In the meantime, I'm still a little bit hungry. I'm trying to eat a little bit of pizza while doing this, so I hope that's okay with you guys. And also, because it's not at the biggest group, it's actually quite interesting to have a little bit more interactive session as well. You know, some questions going around, and maybe even you know, have some discussions sometimes. That makes it also more interesting for me to than just be here and tell you and then go okay, go uh, go back again. I traveled three hours to get here from Katowice, the nicest place in. Poland, as far as I uh, got from uh, Chris, who's uh, close uh, living here as well. Nice place in Poland. Um, you all want to move there, I was doing that too. Um, and uh, I'll have to fly tomorrow morning just to be here with you guys. So hopefully you make that time worth it. I'll try to make it worth your time as well. Um, yes. Um, there's an earlier talk done by WePay. And actually, I should put up another link, the one that I did in Amsterdam. Um, this is an earlier talk that you know, approaches kind of the same subject, not an introduction, but just takes a different angle. You can find it here. I'll share the slides afterwards uh, on, the, on the meetup page. That's what normally happens. So I have to ask the meetup guys, so actually, the meetup girls, actually, to do that. It's, a, it's kind of difficult to see your faces when you're hiding behind the, behind the camera. You can find it here, it's actually quite a nice talk, quite elaborate. Some other committers that, uh, uh, um, because it's being done in the Bay Area, uh, there's more people actually there. I'm one of the few ones that are doing it in Europe. I think there's one other person by now. Uh, so I feel sometimes a bit lonely, especially in the, in the, in the chat channels, uh, because you know, they wake up when I tend to go to bed. Right? That's, like, uh, that's how it goes. So sometimes I tend to stay awake a little bit too long to have discussions with them. Um, but they would talk there. Uh, also, the founder or the inventor or the one who thought of doing airflow uh, is there, Maxime Boschema. Uh, is there a uh, little bit about ING. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about ING Bank Slansky. I don't know if you know about ING Bank Netherlands at all. That's where the head of is. Uh, we don't own ING Bank Slansky entirely, uh, so that's why it's still called ING Bank Slansky, although the Slansky name is kind of disappearing, I understand. Um, uh, but in, oh, in the Netherlands, we're kind of the biggest bank there is still, um, and certainly after the credit crunch. Um, and we're pretty big in retail banking and direct banking and also banking. Um, a little bit less in the investment banking, uh, of course, we're as a, as a management and insurance services. Although we, of course, separate of the insurance services uh, uh, four years ago. In Poland, we're about the fourth or fifth largest bank, as far as I know. Um, could be a bit larger or could be a bit smaller, but it's uh, right where we are. I don't know actually how big that thing is, but you know, that's what I found on Wikipedia. So. <laughs> I guess it makes sense. I don't know what they compare it. Um, so why actually we got involved with uh, uh, with uh, Apache uh, Airflow, and I have to put the incubating thing there and do it on camera and say, oh, that's the lawyers of Apache saying, oh, you're incubating, you're not officially Apache yet. So we can break this incubating part, that means that we're in public or just there, you know, to hatch ourselves into a full-fledged Apache product, and it means a kind of having a community around it and uh, making sure that not one company is just influencing every direction of it and the 
know, that's, that's more people are picking it up. And if, if one of the companies would step out that they are participating in it, or one of the people are participating in it, that it would actually still continue. That's what Apache actually provides and tries to make sure uh, that by more or less forcing a kind of process on that, that it actually works. It also does, um, if you come from a company, it actually does trademark analysis, those kind of things, to make sure that if, if you're a company and want to use these kind of products, you're pretty safe. Uh, in using it, uh, and that makes it uh, makes it quite nice as well. <coughs> I really feel that I'm in the spotlight here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so why Apache Airflow? It's uh, um, firstly it's a, it's a, a we consider it a Chrome replacement. Um, if you ever managed Chrome tabs, and uh, uh, that makes it kind of hard uh, to manage that. In the end, it becomes un uh, unmaintainable. Um, and so that's yeah, a bit awkward. Um, and also. Chrome isn't really full tolerant, so if something goes wrong, you have to write all kinds of wrapper scripts around it to make sure that whatever you do is um, uh, you you'll uh, you'll make sure that the faults you create are happening, and that those are definitely happening in a big data space. You know, a web server doesn't work, an API doesn't function. Oh, the data was just not available that day, and you know it will be there the next day. Something else went wrong. That just happens the whole time. Um, so if you have to write that all yourself the whole time, you're going to be pretty busy writing that. Um, secondly, is uh, it's, it doesn't it embraces like say code as configuration, uh, that kind of thing. That's kind of the uh, part of the philosophy behind it. And I'm not eating enough. It's getting cold, so I'm not feeling. <laughs> and we run everything. Everything is being set uh, and created in Python. Mm. So it also doesn't use something like XML, and this is where, if you come from a larger background, or obviously you know maybe about Uzi in the Hadoop ecosystem, that's quite known. Nobody really likes Uzi. I mean, everybody was forced to use it because it was the only one that's available to do these kind of things. But nobody likes it. It's a pretty tough, let's say, in, in managing the uh, Debugging, for example, is kind of hard to do. Um, making sure that it actually works. Uh, Uzi forces a kind of way of working on you that is not always so easy to apply, uh, apply to uh, what your workflows are. Um, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. It's also testable, so because it's Python code, you can actually compile it and see if that actually already works, and you can actually do some basic testing on it. So uh, instead of that in your XML somewhere, there's a mistake uh, and you're tracking that down because your XML parser throws something out like a uh, percent uh, something and it doesn't work. As it is, uh, and you find it at the runtime here, you can do it actually before. You can write unit tests against your DAGs in the end. Uh, like I said, it's uh, uh, Python code. It's uh, pretty extendable. Uh, a lot of people are sort of providing you know, just PRs to Airflow itself or they write their own plugins, they write their own operators, they write their own hooks. Uh, for for uh, for their own uh, sometimes proprietary uh, uh, backends like we sometimes have and in, in IG as well. Um, obviously, it became interesting uh, to us as well because it was Apache Incubator, but I got involved before that, um, and uh, but because of that, I became an Apache Committer. Um, it's geared to scale out. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a quite flexible way, so you can run it on your own computer. Um, you can run it on a single server if you want, and you can beef up that server quite for, uh, in, in a vertical way, so adding memory and adding disks. Uh, but you can do it also horizontally if you switch uh, to, uh, to another executor, but accelerated executor. Um, that makes it actually easy, and that's what we're also aiming for, easy to try out on your local computer because it you know, uses a SQLite uh, uh, database. Uh, but if you grow a little bit bigger, you go to MySQL or you go to Postgres, for example, as a backend, and suddenly you have a full fledged workflow system that allows you to do these kind of things, but still are able to test your local data, the DAGs locally. It makes it life a lot easier as well. Um, what also helps is that we have complex dependency rules. You can have like, all kinds of arrows you know, on the UI, um, what the flow of your data needs to be. Uh, to get to the end result, and that can be dependent on dates, it can be dependent on outcomes, it can be dependent on uh, external sources that deliver a file somewhere before something starts running. Those kind of things you can all do. You have branches, uh, you can actually do merges, merges again. Uh, 
Um, all these kind of things are possible in Airflow. So that's actually quite nice because it's sometimes not there or you have to do it quite linear. Um, it also has pools, so meaning uh, uh, that you can actually limit the parallelism of how your <coughs> tasks are executing across uh, the things you're doing. Um, and finally, uh, it both has a CLI that's quite easy and quite elaborate to use and being extended every time. Uh, but the best thing probably is also there is has a web UI that is functional and has uh, you know has a great interface in comparison maybe to uh, to other ones. Before I actually continue, because I forgot to ask you guys a question: Who knows about Airflow? Who is using it? Ah, one, two, two guys. Who knows about it? One, two, three, four. Ah, okay. So. <laughs> Should I have a, do, I, I don't know what kind of questions you will have because you came in here, the ones that did, that did do not know Airflow. Um, should I explain myself a little bit further uh, what Airflow actually is or is it, uh, uh, are you finally continuing through the, through the presentation? No answers? I mean, uh, we can continue. I, I can continue? Okay, all right. Please ask questions if something is unclear, especially for the ones that I don't know about it, which obviously of all so for the ones that are using it. But if there's something unclear, don't hesitate, and uh, we're here to uh, explain and share it. Um, that will make it a lot more uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Apple also has a group in the Roman community. I think about four months ago, uh, I gave, you know, I gave a, a light talk in, 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 in Amsterdam. Um, we grew by 470 stars, I think. We have a little bit more for, uh, more forks now. Uh, obviously, the the, the, uh, the during the summer maybe the, the, the mailing list was a bit less active uh, because people go on holiday. Um, and uh, we have uh, 1,041 ERs closed, and I think that was an increase of about 75 the first the last couple of months. And it's actually pretty. It's a pretty fast community, a little bit slower nowadays in the Apache area because that's you know makes things go a little bit slower. Um, but the, uh, the the speed of what the, what the development is quite high. We're actually having a bit of difficulty keeping up with doing releases on it because you know the changes are happening so quickly, and we're just a bunch of guys uh, from Airbnb and, and from ING uh, trying to manage those uh, those uh, those releases and getting it through. And Apache release is actually quite cumbersome to do. Uh, because you need to do the license checks, all these kind of things need to be in place. And the first one to do is like, it's, it's kind of tough to do. So we're a bit behind, unfortunately, that. Uh, but lots of people are actually switched to master and run that one, uh, you can do that too. Um, maybe a little bit, because that was, uh, somebody asked me to explain it uh, here, is that Airflow is a philosophy around ETL or ELT, which is called the data, the big data area, is uh, that it uh, evolves around dates, um, and that means okay, we you can actually set intervals, set your start date, so you set intervals based on on, on, on times basically, and not on do you want to skip certain you know uh, certain moments in time or something like that. That's all. That's all about uh, uh, timings there. So if you have a task that loads a set of data from one database to another database um, kind of is assumed that you want to do that on a date-based assumption. Why is that? Uh, because if you have to load that set of data the whole time, mm -hmm. you either have to keep track of, uh, of what is the la latest uh, primary key that you, for example, actually loaded and you want to uh, move it over because you might not want to load all the, you don't want to load all the data every time. In, uh, in the next database, you want to probably store deltas because the amount of data you'll be actually moving over might be a bit too big otherwise. Um, but out of the box, uh, Airflow already gives you, uh, gives you the, uh, the, the idea of doing that on execution dates. When are you executing this task? Do you want to do it by day? Do you want to do it by half an hour? Do you want to do it by week? Uh, do you do it one way every month? Uh, and it will tell you actually uh, what the interval is in your task. So you can actually work with that during the, the transforming and the loading of the data that you're doing. That makes it much easier to do delta work basically on your data uh, than some of the others uh, are allowing you to do or you have to do by, uh, by hand basically program it for you. Um, 
And this is throughout airflow itself that we, that we start with that. So execution dates, start dates, uh, they are often, often used in intervals as well. So what does airflow actually look at or look like from an operational perspective? Um, if you, you know, start airflow for the first time or work with it the first time, um, you have a, well, I talked about the web server, that's a nice web UI. It also has an executor that is actually executing the tasks uh, for you. Uh, and there's an airflow scheduler running uh, to make sure that those tasks are actually scheduled. And we'll have a backend database that stores all that kind of thing because the ID in uh, the guy who created it, Maxime, uh, used to be a DBA in the past. And you know, he's just database minded. And so he says state needs to be in the database. That's what he's doing. And that's what he did with, uh, with, uh, with Airflow. So that's kind of the central place where we keep state for the things that are happening. Um, you'll have an option to use an application backend uh, for the web UI at the moment. Uh, there's some work uh, being done on, uh, on having an API available uh, that you can do some other stuff as well that you can integrate with other features there. Um, but if you start, if you start with, I'm uh, here, take another piece, so I don't be afraid. Um, if you start with, with Airflow, actually a lot of people are forgetting that you have to start the schedule. Because the schedule, with, if you have cron, for example, if you're used to do Azkaban, for example, you run your things through cron, or Luigi, for example, is also a, a one that you need to kick off yourself. So they'll look at cron and expect that actually to run. Airflow has its own scheduler to make sure uh, that those tasks start running. So sometimes we have questions on the mailing list, and I had a kid a question uh, actually a couple of days ago. So I said, yeah, but my, my tasks are not working. Uh, but did you actually start the scheduler? <laughs> Is there a scheduler involved? Yes, there's a scheduler involved. Because that's kind of important you know, to schedule those tasks and to pick them off. Um, then we have the, uh, the executor with it. And here's sometimes a bit of confusion. If you install, uh, install uh, and Airflow out of the box, pip install Airflow, you will configure it for you to use a SQLite database. We basically assume that you're running it on a dev development workstation, for example. And then you want to start as soon as you can. And so if you want to, if you type in scheduler, uh, Airflow scheduler, you want to have the scheduler start. Instead of that, you need to configure all kinds of backends before you can actually, you know, taste it a little bit and feel what it's doing. Uh, however, if you go more towards to production-like things, yes, I think it's smart to switch your scheduler because the sequential scheduler that's involved with, uh, uh, with your first installation does not allow any parallel tasks to run. And that doesn't really make sense, obviously, if you go to a, to a server installation. Um, and then you have a choice. You can go to a local, uh, a local, uh, a local executor, which means uh, the, the, uh, the executor runs in pace with uh, uh, with the uh, with the scheduler, every time the scheduler runs and ends up at the uh, at the end of its loop, it will actually ask the the, the executor, the local executor, hey, uh, execute these tasks and make sure that you report back. So that runs in process. Um, and then you have the salary executor. That is a I don't know if you know, know salary itself. Salary itself is a is a is a uh, is a is a basically a framework for running those kind of. Uh, tasks in a, in a worker, master worker version, fashion, um, you can select salary and then it runs out of process of the scheduler. And so you can basically turn the scheduler off and still the tasks that were executed will still be running. And then you can restart the scheduler again and then we'll just start requeuing those tasks that you, that you need to do. So if you want to replace parts of it, you can actually do that. Um, but for the local scheduler, that isn't the case. Only the local scheduler is, you can only run it once. Some people, some daring people, do actually run it multiple times across multiple places. That also, that also involves multiple schedulers. We keep state in the database. Is it really supported? Eh, you might find that your tasks start executing well, execute twice, which does not have to be bad if you use, an, uh, if you use your task and uh, execute in idempotent, and I'll get back to that, uh, idempotent fashion. You, know, you just run it twice and you get the same kind of results. That's basically what it says. Um, but sometimes you might not want that, and it doesn't seem very efficient either. I've, there, I've, we get mixed reports and mixed results from people doing that, and we try to actually improve by doing the locking in the database better that that can't happen. But I can't promise you that you can run two schedulers at the same time uh, and, uh, and don't have an issue. So 
So if you want to look at where, if we want to look at high availability kind of scenarios, then the scheduler is a place that we need to work on uh, to make high availability actually really true and make it actually volleyable or horizontally and scalable. Uh, if you want that, uh, because a database, we can actually uh, use a, 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 a multi-master replication if we need to. Uh, we can use the airflow scheduler as the, as the only point that's uh, still single, uh, I guess. Any questions around this? No. So, in fact, scheduler is a single point of failure of this solution. Yeah. So, yes. what is the best way to 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 start with the point of single point of failure, what is the best way to, uh, to make it uh, high, to make a high availability? Uh, well, you have monitoring scripts for these kinds of circumstances uh, that you know, monitor uh, a monitor schedule or start it up again, or if you are, uh, you know, have a, uh, if you are afraid of that the box entirely fails, you sometimes have monitoring scripts that you know, fire up the other. Uh, other uh, instance there. This is currently just outside outside airflow itself, um, but there's like a very uh, very uh, uh, very effective uh, uh, things for doing that. Um, we don't have a lot. I the, the Airbnb guys who, who run the largest installation of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of airflow. As far as I'm aware, they just use supervisor. I don't think they use any failover on uh, or high availability on. Uh, the airflow scheduler. They run 50,000 tasks a day on these kind on on uh, on this. Um, it seems kind of stable. Let's say that. And the so other thing. What about failure of the server? Yeah. So like I said, failure of the server it means that. But then it's also it goes uh, outside anyway. Uh, then you have monitoring scripts actually taking care of that, and you need to configure that currently by yourself. Uh, we just don't fully support a uh, a uh, second scheduler running next to it at the same time. Your mileage might vary, so you might try it and please report back and tell us where it goes wrong because we just, you know, we don't run that ourselves. Uh, so I can't tell you where the, where the issues will lie. I do think that if you, uh, like I said, set up your tasks um, in a way that they're always item bounded, so they always deliver the same kind of result with the same kind of execution date, then you will be fine uh, in running too. Maybe you'll start two tasks at the same time, sometimes. But if you if you if you're okay with that and you're more worried about that your server will fail, ah, okay, then you can choose for it. That's an option. Does a scheduler process uh, keeps any stages or everything is persistent in database? I mean, after failure, will it uh, uh, after restart? Will you go further or in fact will? It will go further. It will go further. So it no, no, do not keep any state. State. No, no, it, 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 keeps, it keeps state in the database, but it, and it actually has some state in the executor because you know the, the executor, uh, between, there's some communication between the scheduler and the executor. Um, and at startup, we actually ask the executor, what do you still have? Um, and if that does not comply with which, what we see in the database, we actually reset the states in the database. Uh, to make sure that those tasks get scheduled again because they obviously haven't been scheduled at that time, they just got lost somehow. So we'll make sure that, that, uh, that those tasks actually are picked up again. So it, it, it checks the integrity of what it knows what the state was and fixes the integrity uh, to a point where it actually can manage it again if, uh, if needed. So yes, you can kill it off and it will restart. Uh, where it left off, basically, figure out with the executor where it has actually uh, left off at that time. Um, to go down and go down a little bit further in that executor area, I actually mentioned a couple of things there. Uh, so we have the sequential executor. There's also a Mesos executor. I think few are using that. I um, don't have any experience with it. I don't, it's also in the code trip folders. So you can use it. Uh, and please uh, supply feedback on how it works because we don't, we're not using it actively. And not as far as not any of the, of the main, uh, main contributors are actually doing it. Um, yeah, so, uh, it's a great executor. That's the one that you get out of the box. Uh, and you get it for free, <laughs> you don't have to much with it. Uh, it works, uh, it's very low complexity, but all, everything works locally and only one at a time. That's what you get. If you are want to know more parallelism, you want to try some things, you'll have to switch your backend to a database that allows concurrency. 
because this is the reason we use sequential, the sequential executor for SQLite. Does not allow any concurrency on the on the database, and as you won't use it for uh, for production use, or at least we don't support that. Um, we think you know, it doesn't make sense to uh, do all kind of fancy stuff to actually allow a local executor or a salary executor to run on a SQLite database. It doesn't really make sense. This is just the sequential executor is there to get you started as soon as possible. Local executor. I am. Uh, I. Uh, I told you guys about that. Um, um, it's, uh, it's quite simple to set up. You just need a, a MySQL database, a Postgres database as a backend, and uh, and uh, turn it on, and, uh, and it will start working for you. Um, there's some questions about. And there's still some discussion about using the num runs feature. Um, and actually, in master, there's currently a feature where I'm not too happy about that. It actually stops running. That the scheduler itself stops running after a certain point in time. Uh, you can configure that. Uh, but you can, can't turn it off currently. Uh, that's because actually something happens in the salary executor that it stops accepting uh, uh, stops accepting the task at a certain point in time. And we don't know what that point in time is, otherwise we would have covered it. And restarting uh, restarting the executor actually helps fixing it, or restarting the, uh, restarting the scheduler actually helps fixing that, or work around it. Um, but it's not required on a local executor because it's actually uh, due to the way the bus works with Redis or with RabbitMQ that you use with uh, with uh, with Celery. Uh, that there's uh, there's something going wrong in the communication there, um, and uh, therefore it gets stuck. And we only have one report on local executor doing that, and I don't think that's actually correct. So uh, you don't have to use it; you can use it, but uh, uh, scheduler should stay up and running. Unfortunately, you actually have to have a script now that constantly restarts it if you run master. Um, so we executed so the local executor, but is used uh, in about 50% of the installations. Also, the larger ones, so WeBay, for example, uh, uses a local executor. They just get a very beefed-up server that runs those scripts. Um, but the other part is actually using it as a as a scale-out uh, mechanism as well. So there's one guy in Russia, as far as I know, he, uh, he runs it on 5,000 cores, uh, and he does some Bayesian classification of uh, of email, I think. Uh, and he does that on uh, with Celery. Um, so with Celery, it gets a bit, bit more complex, uh, and that's uh, that's uh, 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 like I mentioned. Uh, you suddenly have Redis uh, or you have RabbitMQ, you have some query going on, and you need to understand a little bit better, uh, better for uh, how these kind of things actually work. But as you see, there's like a nice gradual path in complexity. Uh, you probably won't touch. Uh, the need for the salary executor right away, and uh, so you might want to start with the local or with the sequential executor on your local laptop. Uh, if you want to run some things in production, hey, you start with the local executor, and then suddenly, hey, I'm running 10,000 tasks. Okay, maybe you want to switch to the salary executor to make sure that there's more nodes actually doing the work for you. Seems to make sense. Okay. Any questions around this? Yeah, I've got a question uh, about the local executor. Yep. Uh, because we started using Airflow with the local executor, and we had every several days a problem that just it stops scheduling tasks. Oh, so you're actually actually saying that I was wrong with the number ones part here. So we just switched to salary, yep. and it started working right away without any problems. But with the local executor, at least with the, the, the latest release version, there is some kind of problem. One we, would check one would be free? Yeah. Okay. We and don't have a skill to that bucket, so I don't know what's going on there, but with the local executor, it was just stopping and nothing was working. You have any long running tasks, so is the, is the local executor actually really stopping or is it waiting for a task to finish before it continues to loop? Because that's what happens. Like I said, the, 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 uh, the, the local executor runs in process with the, with, the, with the scheduler and the scheduler loops across all the DAGs that are available. And at the end, it goes to the executor and says, please give me your heartbeat and the, heart and the heartbeat actually means for the local executor, means to schedule tasks. Get the, get the results and make sure that the tasks are finished before you re, uh, report back. That's what happens. So it could be, but I'm not sure on what you're reporting, but you could have a look at that. Is that you have maybe one longer running task and you're expecting that scheduler to continue and run asynchronously with the, with the scheduling of the task, but that's actually not the case. Um, so it runs in process, so if you do it out of process, what happens with salary? 
because it just sends it to the sodium work and that queues it on the, on the Redis or on the Redis queue. You are immediately, you don't have that issue anymore. But you might have the other issue that you know, you have to set on the queue. I'm really interested in you know understanding what happens there because I'm not seeing it myself. I've never seen it. I know the Airbnb guys actually are implementing some workarounds for it. Like I said, that it is still the scheduler after a fixed amount of time mm -hmm. uh, or after number. Um, but I have not seen that behavior really yet. So it, it makes it difficult for it. It's not that you can like, touch it and uh, uh, fix it here. Um, still, the rest of the, the scheduling, and the, like I said, if you restart the scheduler, it will pick up again and it will start working again. So you don't have to worry about the integrity of what's going on in your, in your task. Any other questions about this? Um, the other thing is that what people need to get used to uh, is you definitely need to run your, uh, your servers or anything you do in UTC. You can run it obviously on, on your laptop as it will start kind of working, but uh, there are some, um, and the, uh, like I said, this is Maxi, by the way, so this is the guy that thought of it. Um, he really actually responded once on the question, and so the, the engineers here in Airbnb is meaning that respond actually in UTC if you ask them what time it is. So this is kind of ingrained currently in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Airflow itself. So there's a patch out, there's a PR out that makes sure that at least all the times that we're going to be storing are going to be set in UTC and that paves the way to make uh, and make uh, airflow time zone aware uh, because then we can actually calculate the difference but at the moment we sometimes use datetime.now and sometimes we're using datetime.utc.now that you know that doesn't really work if you're having if you're in a different time zone like you're here then you will uh, uh, store GMT plus two if you do dot now, and you can see now gives you GMT, but the database doesn't see the difference. So then you got that, yeah, that kind of thing doesn't work. So currently, um, if you deploy to production, your times need to be in UTC. So remember when you do a start date at a certain point in time, or a uh, execution date in time, you are looking at a UTC date that you need to set. Um, and I, I have to admit, I mean, when we're looking at this, it's kind of, you know, for an enterprise, for IT, it's actually kind of annoying sometimes. Because, you know, the other systems that we run do not always run UTC. And by the way, we definitely have to deal with daylight saving times, for example. UTC does not care about daylight saving times. So, in that area, uh, there's improvement to be done. Uh, but this is also, uh, you know, it's not the biggest burden for us, so it's not that we want to fix it right away. Um, this is actually meaningful when you need to integrate with backend systems that are either black box or something like that, or you can't influence. Uh, if you just bring in data from another place, then it doesn't really matter so much if that's, uh, if that's so important. Except when a cutoff date happens in payments, for example. That if we need to send it to the central banks, uh, then you have, so you have to do with, uh, deal with the cutoff date. And that changes if they don't save time. So, yes. In the future, we might actually uh, want to fix that uh, before we before we apply in that area, um, but we're doing it more on the customer base here. Other thing is, is that um, and what sometimes uh, creates some confusion is task at, uh, run at the end of the period and not at the beginning. And uh, what does it actually mean? So if you come from a cron world, you say Run, run at 12 o'clock midnight, and then run kicks off your task. But in this case, if you say, okay, I start my schedule at uh, here's 2016 and 1st of June at 9 o'clock in the evening, then and you want to run it hourly, we say, okay, it will not start running at 9 o'clock, it will start running at 10 o'clock. The execution date will be nine o'clock. Why is that? Because we assume that you will be running at the. You want to have used that date in selecting, for example, data from a database, and then you want to select it until up until that uh, that date at that moment. This is just an assumption that was set at the beginning. This is what the, the, the philosophy 
uh, for airflow. There's actually some talks about that to make it configurable, to make it easier for people that are moving to airflow from prompt-based or uh, other systems that actually use the beginning of the period, because it's just a matter of convention that we do it, and it's a matter of how you configure or create your own task. But at the moment, you need to be aware of that if you have an interval with it, and you want to run it hourly, we run it at the end of the uh, of the period, and uh, and your execution date will actually be the one that we set to the uh, to the uh, 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 to the one that is executed before. Um, so that's uh, something to remember, especially at the beginning. It's kind of confusing to wrap your mind around if you come from the other world. Uh, from the I understood from Max that if you come from the data world, this is kind of logical to you. But that's it. And the other thing is, is you go to the web UI and not even be entirely clear how to stop or kill a task. Because that's what the question that we get sometimes too. Um, but stopping or clearing or stopping or killing a task just means actually clearing the state in the database for us. Um, and then because then they can actually start running again if you want. And uh, you can schedule it again. That means just if we set the downstream and we want to recursively kill all the tasks there, we just clear the states in the database and all the uh, tasks that are part of that recursive select will be uh, sent a kill signal, kill or a term, uh, termination signal at that time and later on uh, after they don't uh, terminate quickly enough we actually send them a kill signal. You do it this way, so you clear, you select downstream recursive or whatever you want, you want to go to the past, you want to go to the future, you want to see upstream, upstream meaning uh, previous tasks. Um, this is the way you can actually clear those tasks. So there's no stop me now button. Maybe we'll create it in the future. Maybe it might make it a bit more intuitive. Um, but it does exist for people that think it doesn't exist. Um, you can also run a task, so force running one task. Normally we'll assume that you run a set of tasks. Okay, sorry about that. You run a set of tasks because we you define a, 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 a cyclic graph, um, and by that cyclic graph there we think okay that instantiation in time is a DAG run. That's what we call a DAG run. So that's a set of tasks together. We call that a bit of an atomic thing to do. Um, but we, you can actually do the uh, a, a set of one task to try it out, for example. Uh, of course, at the moment I'll be working in Celery Executor. Um, so either you need to do it uh, differently or clear everything and uh, run just part of it. If you are on, uh, on sequential or local, um, I think some people wanted to change it. I have not seen a PR yet. Uh, we're not getting by. Um, there you go. Uh, I, thought I talked a little bit about idempotent. Idempotent meaning that at any time that you run a certain task, or a certain part of a task, or a certain part of, of the of the deck or the deck itself, it's um, it's uh, it delivers the same kind of results. And that means, if for example, if I load some data into a database and I, I store those results, if I rerun that task, it should be able to actually add those again add those results again and deliver the same end set in the database. So wrap your mind around that a little bit. That means that, okay, uh, um, uh, I have a, a selection of uh, a payments, for example, and I select uh, from today to, to tomorrow. I load them in a database. And, I'm, uh, and if I rerun that, re the task, it will actually put those same results back into the database by before actually removing the older ones or somehow dealing with the database issues that you can all insert a primary key twice, for example. This makes it much easier uh, when you are actually adding, adding data to it, so deltas are much easier to, uh, to accommodate for, uh, but it's also easier uh, to add specific tasks in the future and it, uh, and it really embraces the, uh, the use of the execution dates and the uses in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in how we work with the dates to make sure that you can always deliver those results and you can restart tasks uh, in, uh, uh, in whatever kind of fashion you want uh, because that makes it, uh, uh, make it a bit easier. If you would do it in another way, not based on the dates for example, how would you restart the task and, get, uh, and, and deliver the same kind of results to your uh, potential customer? 
if you get a different outcome every time you run it because you know something has changed that is a bit awkward uh, and sometimes it doesn't work and it also works better for auditing uh, if you can deliver that kind of uh, the same kind of outcome. Um, so here, if you have a little spoof exporter, I think it should be a spoof exporter. Uh, do that. Uh, you can actually say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm actually executing some of the, over uh, moving some of the data, and by, uh, if the uh, if there's a retry happening, which can happen because something fails on the way, it's it's like it's messy. It's a messy arena where you're in. You're going on the internet or whatever. Um, you might want to truncate the data in a database. And then you get to terminate the database. And so it's a callback, it's a Python callback. You could do whatever you want, but you can reset the state in such a way that that task you can actually rerun on a retry and deliver the same kind of check. So we allow you to, you know, have a very dynamic way of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of dealing with these kind of issues, um, but make, making and uh, doing that in a manageable way. Any questions around this? No. It's very quiet, it's a bit warm, maybe. <laughs> well, it's in there still, you know, there's one drink left. So, so I'm offering one drink, but it's, uh, uh, if somebody wants it, I can throw it at you. <laughs> uh, what also is possible is actually to generate your task programmatically. And this is where, of course, the power of using a programming language instead of uh, XML comes, in, it comes to play. And uh, here you can imagine that, uh, that you want to uh, list file names on ACFS and dynamically actually generate the tasks based on the amount of, uh, amount of file names that are available there. Um, so you loop those file names that you got from ACFS when you loaded them and then uh, you get a, 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 a ingest operator. So you get maybe 20 or you get 10, uh, 10 operators out. I have to say, is it entirely dynamic? Well, you actually see the way it's being loaded at the beginning, at the, at when we read the DAG for you, um, we execute that part. So it's a kind of cool DAG is actually slow moving. So it means that is it, uh, can you rerun or recreate task entirely on the fly? And so, meaning I, I run it now and I have a different set of tasks in uh, a second later. Uh, while there's the same kind of uh, names available there. That's not entirely how it works because that makes the scheduler a bit uh, confused because you know what kind of order of the task do, does it need to run. So it's kind of slow moving. So that list of uh, file names that can change over time while those tasks are running. But if it changes, uh, if, it, if, it, if you would make it an example of it, a bit different, it would be a bit hard to explain right now, but it's a, uh, there's some questions sometimes to make it fully, uh, fully change. Um, if you're using a single task uh, sensor, meaning you want to make sure that you know your task is, a, is, a, is a dependent on another task in another deck and then it gets run, um, you want to make sure to manually erase the priority of the task is waiting for. Uh, because otherwise you might have a full pool and that task never gets to run. So the pool will be full and your task you will never get you know, they will never get executed or the ones that are waiting, are waiting for it. There might be a lot of external sensors, task sensors actually waiting, but they will take up the full pool or the max of the maximum of parallelism uh, and then the task that they're actually waiting for cannot run. So you definitely want to increase the priority of the tasks that uh, that it's waiting for, and of course, we are lowering from the external center, uh, from the external class sensor before you do that. Um, the other way is to actually limit the amount of sensors by putting them in a pool separately. You can do that as well. Um, uh, the, uh, here you go. Uh, uh, we have longer running tasks if you want to limit, uh, limit the load on your uh, scheduler. Uh, you want to uh, limit the heartbeat or increase the heartbeat actually uh, of the of the the the, the scheduler to ensure it doesn't it doesn't you know try to try to schedule tasks that are just not there every time uh, then you want to increase that scheduler scheduler amount of oh, the heartbeat of the scheduler and obviously smaller tasks make it for easier debugging and retrying this means splitting up your tasks and it also makes it easier for easier parallelization by the way. So if you put everything in one 
batch operator, which we started doing as well. So when we converted to Airflow, uh, we had large scripts running. And so what, basically what we did, we created one operator in Airflow, and that called a batch operator, which runs batch scripts. And then yeah, the whole script started running. Ah, so when it fails, somewhere in the middle, how do you restart that until that part? And uh, the item potent part is difficult, but also debugging it, where, where did it fail? And if you came halfway, you might not want to redeploy all the data before that, but you'll have to because you don't know where, you didn't know where it stopped. So how to split it. So it's smart to actually split up the task in the smallest manageable bits you can actually think of, and the smallest item potent bits you can think of. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a, it makes it much easier to do so. Then. And um, uh, probably choose your start date. Uh, the scheduler sk will actually fill in gaps. So um, if, if you want to change the schedule a task is running on, please also change your DAG ID with it. Because otherwise, the scheduler, you know, the, the scheduler looks at intervals. And if that summary is here, you will see that you, your interval is not right anymore. But we look at the previous date to determine when it should actually run again. And that makes it a bit awkward in, in, in how it needs to schedule. So if you want to have a new schedule for your deck, change the deck ID uh, because that makes it uh, it makes it possible to do so. Otherwise, you get some confused schedule going on. Might be fixed in the future. Don't know what to do with it yet. And the change in deck ID is actually quite simple to do. Um, so it, uh, it uh, resolves uh, resolves a lot of issues, especially while you're developing. Um, you might enter that might enter this because you'll just know oh, it's the wrong start date or it's the wrong it's the wrong interval that I used. Make sure that uh, that you then reset the data or just reset the database entirely if you do it on your uh, on your local machine. Um, and uh, if you think that you need, do need to fill a gap where you want to have. Uh, something else running there, and that is not being managed by the spreadsheet. <coughs> so maybe you have an interval of one week every time, but suddenly there's a need to actually run it half in half that week, uh, in the middle of that week. That's what I mean. So on Wednesday, for example, uh, you probably want to use a backfill because the backfill actually ignores the scheduling. Uh, with that, it does. If you give it a couple, if you give it a range of dates, it uses the scheduled dates. Uh, but the scheduler will ignore what the backfills are doing, so you can actually fill in gaps by using the backfills here. So that allows you a bit more flexibility in case you have to need you know, to go beyond the, the normal the normal speed. So maybe now a bit, a bit to a use case after all this talk about the concepts and the way we do things, I'll show you a bit of a use case that we're actually uh, 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 executing within our uh, in our domain is um, it's it's a classical ELT or ETL, whatever you want. So we we'll move data from the left and we want to put it out in a database server at the end and bring it to the user in a nice tablet way or something like that. Uh, we are not here, obviously, I think, to talk about the tablet part uh, because that's another group of people. And we're looking more about on the, on the, on the left side here. Um, and so for us, we're looking at doing a lot of transactions. Uh, to get combined with rich data, have some product data and have some external data available. Um, and then by either Flume, XFP or Scoop, XFP is a somewhat, somewhat commercialized SSH uh, stuff. Um, uh, we actually ingest it and uh, through uh, Kafka eventually maybe when it becomes a bit more real time. Um, and then we'll uh, move that to, uh, want to move that to ACFS, uh, run some Spark jobs, maybe test jobs if we really need to. Uh, that is, uh, should be carried to the grave, in my opinion, very quickly. Um, it was a monster to start with, and it should end very quickly too. Um, then we scoop it and we bring it to Postgres. <coughs> the Charlotte Postgres, also in this, for this one, actually, it's like four Postgres servers, so we need to take care of that also in the things we do. And we use Airflow to manage the part from picking up the data from uh, Flume, XMP, and Scoop. Uh, move it to, uh, to ACFS, run the Spark jobs or the test jobs, and then scoop it to the Postgres server. So it's the, the data side to it. Obviously, the delivery of those data sets is actually done, uh, done by other systems. Um, so firstly, is, a, is, a, is a, that we verify whether the, the files actually exist, and then the next, uh, the, the next uh, parts can actually kick off. So this is just a sensor that's pulling the file system, did my file arrive, did my file arrive, did my file arrive, yes, file arrived, 
I can start. So it starts pulling on a certain interval at a certain point in time, on a, and it will reschedule itself after a certain interval. Uh, but we assume that maybe due to network congestion, the data might just be a bit later than we expected it to be. So we want to pull that kind of data before uh, uh, the place before we actually start executing. Um, and that <coughs> um, is the big one is just basically copy because it's quite a simple one. Um, copy the data to HDFS uh, and then uh, uh, compress it on uh, the place that where we have the original data. So that's a branch because we need to scan and execute it in parallel with the others. Um, and then copy the transactions from, uh, from, uh, from the place where we put it in and then bring it over to the original data site. Um, again, we compress it a little bit and then we run the transaction, uh, uh, run the transaction transformation and then we we'll give it a, uh, uh, a little real private individual detection, I think it is. Because we are, are, are pretty uh, anal about privacy protection. Uh, we'll make sure that we actually separate off the private individuals there. Make sure that we do not recognize you personally in the data when you do something in there. And that, that doesn't happen. Uh, but unfortunately, transaction systems obviously store that kind of data. So somewhere we need to clean it up. Um, another, fall, an another example here, and uh, it's a bit more complex, is uh, again load the data into the tables, prepare uh, prepare some of it. This is really a uh, thing. Go to the, the, to, uh, to the next part and create the, the partitions uh, for it. Um, and then uh, we want to actually have the shards. Like I told you, we have multiple database servers because the big data side, you know, stays big data when you move it to the front end sometimes, in a way. It will, might be smaller than we started really with big data, but still it uh, uh, moves half terabyte of data to those. Uh, uh, to those database servers. Uh, and so we shard it and we say, okay, on the right side, uh, we'll have uh, different Postgres servers in this case, and these are dynamically generated. Uh, we'll go over the dynamically, we'll just say somewhere in a config file, run those machines. We have uh, four machines, now we have six machines, then we suddenly have six tasks in there, and we'll run some, uh, run some scripts at the end there. Scooping here to the database, so here you get. Uh, you have the shard parts here, and then we still run uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, items there to actually move it over uh, to, uh, to the database server. We parallelize those, uh, uh, and sometimes we actually choose to not put them in parallel because the database servers cannot handle the load they're getting from the amount of data that we put in there. Uh, so then we need to be a bit slower and we'll make it uh, in, a, in a sequential order. Um, okay, so the last bit, uh, draft roadmap, what's going on, what are we working on, uh, the Apache release, well it's in progress, it's in progress since the June to be honest, uh, but uh, due to, to, to holidays and people not being there and sometimes the challenge is of doing the license checks and uh, compliance checks with Apache is, uh, is not as fast as we want, but I think we're pretty close, the last bits were closing down and we have some questions about uh, Fixing some Google <coughs> operators and uh, one security issue that we had with the GitHub integration, the GitHub Enterprise Authentication had an issue that's been fixed. Um, so we can uh, probably have at least the code ready and then it becomes a voting process with the IPMC from Apache. So then they'll vote if we can actually release it and then probably we have to fix a couple of things first and then we can release it. So understand how it does. It looks like a big company, the Apache thing. It's, uh, it feels the same. To me. Um, we are, uh, uh, nowadays also allow you to do an auto-aligned start date um, in a master. What does that mean is that uh, um, what we used to have is that your interval needed to be perfectly aligned with the start date you actually gave. So if you said I want to do it, run it hourly, you need to give, it, uh, give an hourly start date. So uh, 2100 hours for example if you want to have an hourly start date. Nowadays we actually align it so we check whether uh, 2100 all one hours actually aligns with that hourly interval. If it doesn't, we take uh, the, the next one, so then it will, in this case would become 2200 hours. But if you perfectly align, we'll start at the perfectly aligned date. Uh, it makes it a bit easier because we, there was some confusion about that. And then DAG run, the back fills to actually DAG runs that makes it sure that you actually see them in the uh, user interface as well. <coughs> Improve the pooling. Uh, there's, work, there's the possibility that you sometimes overdraw a little bit from the pools. So 
So instead of you, you know, you created eight pools, or eight, you have a pool of eight, and it might overdraw to nine or ten. Why is that? It's locking in the database not being done properly, and uh, and the calculations not happening there uh, uh, done properly there. Uh, let's say in progress, uh, dark deck parsing isolation that's been done. So that means that uh, we just run every deck in a separate process and get the results from there. It used to be that if you had a really faulty deck that you would actually be able to bring down the scheduler. Kind of your own fault if you did that. I mean, if you supply faulty, uh, faulty uh, machine. But we want to be more robust and maybe make more people uh, uh, be able to actually put those decks there. I mean, if you're from an operational perspective, you allow data scientists to put your data engineers to put your decks there. They might not always be as um, sensitive or uh, experienced with what is needed to make them run pro pro properly. Maybe you have an intern sometimes that makes a mistake, or an experienced person that makes a mistake, it won't bring down a scheduler. Um, REST API uh, is also in progress. I have a PR out for the first implementation of it. We probably have a bit of discussion before it's there, but I'll probably make it this month. Then we have the start of a REST API. That doesn't mean that everything is entirely, obviously, in an API available directly, but we can actually start adding those, and you have better integration possibilities uh, across other systems, uh, obviously the Hadoop system uses a lot of REST calls, uh, and you might want to, you know, trigger a DAG from another system uh, without going through the CLI or it does the, uh, by adding the carriage integration or any other authentication that might be possible. It becomes a bit easier and bit on the security side, a bit better to manage. Uh, because until now, if you had shell access to the Airflow user that was also able to read uh, the Airflow <coughs> configuration, you would basically have access to anything the Airflow thing, what uh, Airflow itself was doing, and you could change anything there. So you had to really trust your user or have proper procedures around that to, uh, to manage that. Now it becomes a little bit easier and uh, you can separate uh, the duties a little bit, which is important in the back. Uh, and probably important in other, uh, in other uh, companies as well. And uh, schedule backfill runs. So instead of the backfill currently runs as a task inside another task. So that means if you schedule, if you run, if you, if you, uh, it's not entirely true, but partially. And so uh, for a sub deck operator, which exists, so it's, a, it's a deck within a deck, uh, that actually runs backfills uh, locally. That means that it's tied to the worker where it's currently running on, and it's uh, tied to the amount of parallel. Uh, uh, process that can run there. It's a bit awkward to have it that way. I mean, it makes more sense to actually have the scheduler manage that because you know it circumvents the scheduler a little bit, um, and that also makes the behavior of sub deck operators a little bit weird. Uh, and besides, if you can actually schedule back for deck runs, it means if you start, you know, by you know calling the API, then it spreads them out also across the uh, different workers that you might have, and uh, makes it more parallel. Uh, and instead of that, you run it locally. Uh, then we stop uh, supporting uh, a DAG syncing across the workers. This is a question that comes back quite often. How do you make sure that your DAGs, so definitions, are synced across the workers, obviously in the, in the salary space? Because uh, you have two machines, three, four, five, six machines. And then uh, in the, uh, the DAGs are there. Sometimes you can use pickling if you want, but it's kind of not recommended to do so. Uh, because that you know, doesn't always end up with the results that you want, or they cannot be pickled in certain circumstances. Um, so serialized. So how do you make sure that those uh, those uh, uh, those uh, DAGs stay in sync across the workers? Because you know they end up with different kind of tasks. Otherwise, if they read that file again, um, possibility is to use NFS if you want. It's a possibility. Uh, you can use uh, uh, synchronization by doing Git. Uh, uh, Git webhooks are ID. Uh, but obviously, this is a space where there's a need uh, because not a lot of people. There are there's a lot of questions around it and how do, what's the proper way of doing it. Well, there is no proper way of doing it. It's what works best in your circumstances, and sometimes that might be NFS, but it's not very popular. Uh, it might be that you want to have another shared file system, or uh, you want to uh, use a Git sync, or you know this, those kind of things. So the Airbnb guys thought of uh, of uh, doing it by uh, by a Git. Uh, repository integration uh, and uh, make it part of Airflow. Um, I myself sometimes think if you have an API, why not submit a DAG to the API and let the workers actually ask if they have the most recent version at the moment they start running. Can also be an option. 
Um, there are several ways of uh, approaching this problem, and I don't think we've decided on which one is the best. It's probably the one that implements it first, that one gets integrated. Uh, at the moment, the, 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 uh, the Airbnb guys seem to feel the pain the most there, and uh, I want to add that maybe. Although, they've been talking about it for three, four, five months now. So, maybe not that much pain. So, 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 uh, so what do they do right, right now? Yeah, Airbnb guys, what they do right now? They do a git sync, so they'll, they'll use a synchronization across the workers and they'll find out that. Okay. And they just, uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's the way they do it. I don't, I, I'm not exactly uh, aware of the, of the details of what they do. Uh, I assume they kick off some, uh, when they deploy, uh, they kick it off by a webhook or something, which is a possibility, I guess. Uh, from our perspective, the security side comes a bit into play because that means that users have uh, access to those areas where you don't want it at uh, the real time. You can circumvent it again, but we're not too happy about it. Um, so can you share what, what you do in your production? Uh, in our production, we basically uh, do... Uh, the, 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 the one that we're running now is actually by Coolmates, and it's called Rigged as a local scheduler, um, so uh, a local executor. Uh, we also had a, a, a salary executor, uh, but when we upgraded, uh, uh, we wanted to have a local executor for a bit. Um, we probably, uh, and we're also, because of that problem actually, um, we're looking at uh, doing a Git webhook integration as well, same kind of thing, because you know, if that gets supported, it makes it easier. On the other hand, like I said, uh, I actually had a, 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 a an implementation, a trial implementation that did do a submit, put it into a file system, and actually let the uh, let the uh, the workers actually ask for that updated DAG and verify whether they had the latest version, and then just uh, and pull it in uh, if they didn't and didn't have it. It's also a possibility, but it makes you dependent on having a either a web server or an API server available, a local server again, that actually picks it up. But the web server, you can actually run twice or three times or four times, so in that case, you're okay. Um, what's coming up is um, if you are running a lot of tasks, especially your, yeah, well, the, the, a lot of tasks in one deck, for example, um, then, uh, then the scheduler will start slowing down a little bit because it needs to iterate over all those tasks and it will verify whether those tasks can run by whatever rule that might be. Um, and uh, that, is, uh, that slows it down because if you have 100 tasks in one deck and you have maybe 10 decks of them, you'll start suddenly seeing that you need to go across those decks the whole time and they do uh, to determine whether a, a task can run. We do some, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, we do an average on it, for example, we do a count. Uh, those kind of things are happening there. That's actually quite a database intensive. If you do this for every task, you start seeing that the time start adding up. And sometimes you'll see waiting times for one loop to finish, uh, sometimes up to a minute, maybe even two minutes. This only happens with a really large set of tasks, by the way. So it's, uh, you won't encounter it right away. And if you limit the amount of tasks per DAG, um, which goes a bit against what I said, split it up as much as you can, but you know, that's just the balance you need to strike. Um, then, uh, then, uh, uh, then you won't get in problem, uh, into, uh, into trouble. However, um, uh, we've been experimenting a little bit with an event-driven schedule. Basically, a task finishes tells the task downstream that it has finished, and then they can determine themselves whether they should start running or not. And this makes it event driven and it makes the loop times for the scheduler much quicker. It goes down to, for the very large sets, to, to four or five seconds. Uh, and that makes it much better at, uh, at uh, closer to real time scheduling or closer to uh, uh, faster scheduling than, than, than it could be in the past. We're a batch oriented uh, uh, workflow system, by the way, if you haven't figured it out. Um, the other part that's, uh, that's a bit of the security side uh, for us is actually make tasks not need the database anymore and then actually go to an API and ask for the details they need. I mean, every task can actually read the full database currently, um, which doesn't really make sense from a security perspective. You can actually also have those tasks actually be supplied with, uh, with the right, uh, with the right uh, information they need to actually run. Um, and they should not need to uh, have access to the airflow database itself. It doesn't really make sense. Um, from a security perspective, there. We have um, roles and principles, <laughs> separation there also coming up. Um, maybe a lesser important, what we also see is that, uh, that there are some uh, um, impersonation 
work being done. So using sudo, for example, uh, and sudo with a user, not as root per se, but uh, rather as another user, to make sure that those run in separate groups. And we see, uh, we see also not on the list, uh, C groups uh, being added uh, to make sure that you limit the amount of resources uh, one <coughs> task can actually do. We've had some talks in the version version tries to actually run on Yarn, for example, uh, because it makes sense to actually, you know, if you have a cluster of a large cluster of uh, of, uh, of Hadoop uh, or whatever else you're actually running to spread around. That. The problem with Yarn is you cannot limit or you cannot go lower than one CPU. Rather, you need to configure Yarn in a way that you say, okay, I have 4,000 CPUs and I have only real in real life I only have 400. Uh, but that re re uh, requires also you to reconfigure, um, reconfigure your uh, your other tasks uh, that you run on that, and that doesn't really seem to make sense. So, in basically, the, the smallest bit yarn can give you is one CPU, uh, as, uh, probably one megabyte. I don't know how far down you can go, but that's the limit you, uh, the, the minimum limit you can set. And often those airflow tasks don't do that much themselves. I mean, those tasks are executing something else that does all the work. So why and, uh, end up, uh, and if you do 50,000 tasks, 50,000 times one CPU, you might actually <laughs> kill your uh, cluster at that time. So that doesn't really make sense uh, if you run all those in parallel. If you are an aspiring committer, or a contributor, or if you're a, if you're a user, the user channel is uh, at uh, Apache Incubator Airflow. We also have a developer channel that's located a bit somewhere else. Unfortunately, not on the, uh, on the Apache brand because due to migration from Airbnb to Apache, we suddenly ended up with a private committer channel, which you're not allowed to have in the Apache rules. Everything needs to be out in the open. So I'm very fine with still being videoed here because it's actually important for the Apache brand. Um, the uh, the, the GitHub repository is located uh, on at, at that address over there. The official uh, repository is located at Apache, but those are kept in sync, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and if you want to find us on, uh, on the, uh, uh, and if you want to talk to us through mailing lists, sometimes that's a better place, especially if you ask us to go a little bit more in depth in certain areas or have a general question that you need to be, uh, you know, the chat doesn't really work in those kind of circumstances, it's not a real issue, but you want to know how things work, for example, then, uh, then the mailing lists are uh, a little bit better. It's a little bit old fashioned maybe, when uh, we saw the, uh, at the oh, uh, well, we go back in time, but the interface can be a bit archaic, in a way sometimes that's a patchy, but uh, uh, it's, it works, I guess. That was it. I hope you enjoyed it. Any questions left? Yeah, I got a question, but maybe the REST API thing answers it. So, do you plan to have ability to push airflow from the outside? Because in our case, we've got certain situations that, that we need to uh, recalculate some things based on external events. So, we actually ended up writing a custom companion service which just listens to, listen to those events yep. and pushes the airflow through, through the command line interface now because there is no other way. Uh, I think you're looking for a trigger DAG functionality or something like that. Then. Um, and that's the, actually the one that I, in the example API file of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the PR, actually made into a, uh, a, a JSON call uh, in this case. So, yes. So this is the idea behind it, to make sure that you can do those kind of things. Obviously, you can already run the Airflow script from the command line and, yeah, and do it from there. there. So mm -hmm. that's what you're doing, I guess. Uh, but yes, that's, that's definitely one of the ideas about, uh, about going for the API, apart from securing access to Airflow itself. Uh, there's two drivers for that, that's definitely integration. Uh, a lot of people have been asking for how do I actually trigger that from, uh, from another place uh, that you, know, uh, you want to do. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes, and will it arrive right away? Well, there's, you know, there's obviously in this kind of services you want to do it right from the beginning, because otherwise you need to do a lot of rework, rewriting those APIs and then, uh, 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 so we'll start maybe a bit small. If you want to have a look at it, it's, uh, uh, it's called aid at API framework on, uh, on, on list and see uh, if it makes sense to you to do it in that way. Uh, and, then, uh, and then have a little bit of discussion there, what works best. Open for that, obviously. Anyone else? I have a question. Uh, have you used Luigi before? And if so, can you compare what's the biggest advantages of using Airflow, for example, in comparison with Luigi? 
Because Inuity also defines workflows in Python. Yeah. Um, the, the, well, first, uh, uh, I've not used uh, Luigi. We've been looking at it, uh, and one of my architects have been looking at it uh, to see whether uh, it would make sense to actually put it in. First thing is, it's Chrome based. Uh, so yeah. you need to, you need to yeah, kick you it off. You have to run workflow uh, yes. from Chrome need or to Mac, well, yeah. yeah, exactly. So this is a bit of a kind of a, uh, a no-go. So how do you deal with retries? I didn't figure it out, but I kind of think that you know it's I don't know how well how that well that's done in, in Luigi. Um, the and it, I would be actually be surprised if they didn't really didn't take care, take care of it. But uh, I did look actually so at some of the code of Luigi just to have some impression of what they're doing and also sometimes actually. Uh, uh, migrating some of the operators over to your phone, which they came in handy. Um, but those are uh, uh, those are the things that we've been seeing. Uh, what I do like about Airflow is the way they do uh, the uh, the outputs uh, the outputs in the inlets of uh, of data. So Airflow doesn't really know about data itself. So it, it specifies a task, and you can specify a downstream task. But what happens with the data of that of, of that output of that task? Can you connect it to another task that expresses a certain kind of input? And then they'll have the notion of uh, I think it's a, a, a kind of file access or file uh, inter or not a file system, but they have the notion of uh, of uh, um, uh, oh, that they are called input and output, but I don't know the exact name for the which you it. But at least. The previous task can specify where it puts the data there, and, and then the, 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 the downstream task the, gets an input from the previous task. Here's, here's where the, the, the data is where you need to pick it up. That's arranged in Luigi. We can also do the same thing kind of in Airflow, but then you would use XCOM for that, and then it's kind of custom. It will work, and it's kind of custom. You need to actually take care of, take, take care of that in, uh, in the operator. It's not by architecture that we actually support it. So that's what I like about Luigi a little bit more. Um, I, I can't, I, I both are pretty mature projects and, uh, and used uh, in, uh, in pretty uh, uh, big companies uh, as well. So Luigi came from Spotify. I know that the trouble was, and I was actually kind of, um, also the, uh, the, the reason to push for an Apache, uh, Apache incubator. Uh, part um, that one of the guys were saying to Maxim, um, Sit and Hom was actually saying, he's from Agari, and he was telling Maxim, Maxim, if you leave Airbnb, what will happen with uh, what will happen with Airflow? Or for whatever reason, if uh, if if Airbnb loses interest and people are actually using Airflow, what will happen with Airflow? Do we need to fork it or bring it up somewhere else? Um, by become, going to Apache, you will get actually a different kind of continuation there. It removes the reliance on one company. They really, it's about community, and it's not about companies. Basically, they don't like anyone saying, "Hey, I'm, uh, we're from Airbnb, so we influence this," or "We're from ING, and we want to have that in." That doesn't work. You do it on personal and at personal level. So I'm personally committed there. ING is definitely not uh, cannot influence that. Um, and I think that's a, that's a good thing too. And also the license part and the, and the, and the, and the license compliance checks that happen because of Apache make Airflow probably a bit more attractive to uh, to companies than uh, than Luigi is because of the, the the community and the things around it that Apache actually arranges. Nevertheless, Luigi is a, a very nice and fine project, and it works pretty well according to the users. So that's it. And I think it has picked up steam a little bit again uh, because uh, the, I think about a year ago, because the, the main committer actually left Spotify at the time, it seemed to die uh, a little bit, or at least slow down significantly. Uh, it seemed to pick up a little bit again, uh, but I'm not keeping track of it every day. That's your question. Anyone else? No. Okay. So, how widely adopted? Uh, Airflow at ING is if you sh if you can share this information with us. Mm. I can still it's adapted in our my team and there's not a lot of other teams that actually have the, the, the maturity to actually start doing the workflow things. Yeah. 
So people, there are some other areas because it's a large company, you want to practice first. Um, people are definitely using cron sometimes and, uh, and, uh, and other things. I haven't seen Luigi, for example, uh, but probably as uh, Uji in certain areas also being used. Uh, definitely in the past because also airflow is quite young. Um, so uh, can't say. Uh, airflow itself, is it entirely packaged enterprise ready? Well, I would say you need to know or need, should not be afraid to dig in sometimes a little bit to understand what's going on. It goes for the whole ecosystem of Hadoop, I guess. Uh, but is there one company like Cloudera or Hortonworks currently uh, embracing uh, one of the other workflow systems beyond Uzi? No, because the, 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 the Hortonworks guys were telling us I oh, would we'll just slap on a nicer, a nicer UI on, uh, on Uzi and it will be fine. <laughs> well, we pay, I'm pretty convinced and my team is pretty convinced that won't be the case. We won't touch Uzi with uh, <laughs> the uh, we won't do it. I mean, maybe in the end the company might force us to, but I think it will be a maintenance nightmare uh, to do so because all those scripts, well, it's, it's, and I mean, not, I don't mean scripts, but I mean all those XML files. It's going to be a mess. And you can use Falcon. And the, the crazy thing is, for, uh, is that if you want to use Falcon for ingestion or changing or whatever you want to do, uh, um, then you suddenly become reliant on Uzi. But it doesn't show what's going on behind the scenes. So if something goes wrong, how do you debug it? And maintenance is actually also quite an important thing. Can I understand when it goes wrong, what goes wrong? Can I actually fix it? when it goes wrong. For us, that's a kind of important. So, no, it's, uh, but IG is also, although we're definitely looking in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the predictive analytics and the advanced analytics, mm -hmm. we don't have a uh, thousand node cluster like uh, Facebook has already. So our, our needs are a bit different and we're maturing, but we're also, you know, we have to take small steps due to privacy regulations, for example. Uh, we're pretty, uh, pretty, uh, careful in, 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 in just increasing that because then you guys will look at us or in other countries. Uh, in, if you go to Germany, it's a one-two second world war. In, 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 in the Netherlands, it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit easier. If you go to Belgium, it's also a different discussion. So you'll see that you will uh, we'll growing slowly and the choices are being made mm -hmm. along the way. I think that works best currently. Answer to your question? Yeah, thank you. For how long have you been using iPhone? At IG, about a year. I guess. So, so slowly picking up. Since, uh, since I say we needed the, the cameras integration. So, this the first patches I added was uh, authentication on, uh, on, on the uh, web UI, because otherwise anyone that fell in, came in could actually see what was going on. Uh, uh, and secondly, it was the, the cameras integration. Uh, at least you could start jobs that understood that when you ran a scoop operator, for example, if it was attaching to a, uh, attaching to a secure cluster. Uh, was it, is it entirely perfect? No, but it does the job for us, but we want to improve that with the API, for example, and, uh, and the cameras integration there. So will you see me doing any GitHub enterprise uh, uh, in authentication integration? No, because I don't know how to. <laughs> uh, but the camera side, yes, uh, that's uh, kind of important for us to make that work. And so it's about a year that we're doing it now. It's a young project. I think it was only sourced in half 2015, so June 2015. Are you using Cardinal or Cloudera in your environment? Uh, in the end, it doesn't really matter. And for us, we're currently using Hortonworks, uh, but um, it's a platform. It's a, it's a, it could be a petty big top if we have four. Uh, uh, so certain things are nice, but certain things are not. Anyone else? Time. Uh, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. If it was, I hope for, hopefully it was interesting to for the especially for the ones that have never heard about it. Uh, I hope I did enough explanation <laughs> around what it was that you got a bit of an idea. If not, please come over and uh, I can, uh, and tell you a little bit more. Um, and otherwise, um, hopefully I'll see you online. I, to see you soon is probably taking it a bit, a bit far. Uh, but yes, that would be actually be nice if you put a picture somewhere and go to the, the PR and say, I saw you, so your uh, talk uh, in uh, Warsaw. Uh, 
Um, it's not that I come often to a uh, university again, uh, and, well, by the way, I'm there tomorrow in Holland as well, <laughs> to do something else. Uh, but uh, it was uh, fun being here, and thanks, uh, thanks for, uh, for uh, you know, being here as well. Cheers, guys. Thank you.